Now this one's quite critical, for sure. I sometimes feel, sometimes score some own goals, re-PR. How important is it for the side to qualify for those 2023 ODI tournament? Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of the Caribbean Cricket Podcast. I'm your co-host, National St. Patrick Hewitt, and with me as ever is my partner in crime, Santolki Nagilendra. Yeah, Mash, well, not as ever, because as keen-eyed viewers will notice, this is the first time we're doing it in real life. No more Zoom te technology connections, issues. We're here, we're in person, and it had to be a monumental episode, right, Mash? Yeah, for real, for real. People won't realise that when we set up the Caribbean Cricket Podcast, actually, this is probably only the fifth time you and I have met face-to-face -face in four years. <laughs> and we finally decided to do a proper filmed, recorded, live in shoot after what five four years of doing this and we're delighted to have our guest today um well, earlier on off camera we'd just spoken to johnny grave and johnny grave said to us how come you haven't done this for me but he's not as special <laughs> he's not as special as our guest today and our guest today is of course the new cricket west indies president kishore shallow kishore how you doing i'm great man i'm pleasure being here with you you gents i'm i'm a fan of the show so, <laughs> so i'm really honored to be the first person, you know, to sit down with you guys in Iran. You know, I'm, I'm really looking forward to this. Yeah, most definitely. And actually, before Santoki takes us away, if you just... Because people will be like, how are you doing this? You're in... They know we're in London. Well, however much you can tell people, how comes you're in London this particular week? Um, cricket business, um, meetings. Of course, there's the Test Championship final. So we, we have a few meetings, you know, around that. Um, yeah, and it's just good to be in London. Most definitely. And, and Santoki... Take it away. I guess firstly, Kishore, congratulations on being elected uh, president of Cricket West Indies. Um, to use a term used in U US presidential terms, the first 100 days is seen as... <laughs> first 100 days in, in America, they say, you know, that's the time when the president sets his marker down, yeah. approves policies, um, gets, gets kind, of, kind of sets a precedent for what his term is going to be like. For you, it's been 76 days as of counting. But in those 76 days, how, what have been the positives and the challenges of stepping into the role as a Cricket West Indies president? Yeah, coming in obviously with the background of being the vice president for four years, you know, it seems as though it's just, you know, continuing the job pretty much with obviously the, 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 the ultimate responsibility of, you know, the book stops with, with, with me. And I've taken on that responsibility quite well. Um, there's some policies that we're just continuing and there are some new ones that we, they're going to take some time, you know, to take shape and to implement and so on. But um, so far, I think it's just getting an understanding that everyone understand my philosophy as, as the leader now. And um, so far, so good, you know, establishing committees, getting a few key personnel on board, um, some shifting around in terms of personnel as well. And yeah, all it is, <laughs> all it is, you know. If you just want to, so you talked about your philosophy as president, so if you want to elaborate on what are the key sort of pillars of your philosophy going into this term? Yeah, I'm quite an inclusive person. Um, I like to listen to others, um, ensure that, you know, they, 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 they know that I value the input, because that is how you tend to get the best out of people. And, you know, so I'm always open to suggestions and so on, you know, and, and even though when I'm not in agreement with your ideas, you know, it's just to let you know, well, you know, I think, well, you know, my opinion and why I, I prefer to do it this way as opposed to, you know, what you're proposing. And so I, I think with that approach over the years, it has certainly worked for me. Um, yeah, so at, at this moment, it's just to ensure that we're all on the same wavelength because if, if we are going to, you know, bump heads and all the time, then we're not necessarily going to get anywhere. And we do invest in this cricket, you know, we are, we, are, we are unique, you know, we are unique. So it's not only about, you know, an organization there, but you're dealing with the politics across the region. Um, so we have to ensure all the territorial boards are on the same wavelength, you know, what are their needs at this point, you know, and just ensuring that everyone understands what is the priority here. And at the end of the day, we all want West Indies cricket to do well, right? Um, so we just have to get that approach right. And I think that the conversations I've had over the last few weeks, you know, the, the persons who are coming around to my approach, um, there's some who are not fully on board yet, and this is from different stakeholders, of course, but with management and change, you know, it takes time, and I totally appreciate that. Out of interest, uh, Kishore, obviously you were vice VP to uh, Ricky Skerritt. Um, so two parts to this question first. Actually, the first part then is how long into Ricky's 
kind of run did you decide or think yeah, I'm going to go for it. Because obviously you've been on the podcast before. You and I have had a conversation and I probably would have probed then. I reckon that was about maybe 10 months ago. Um, Ricky obviously wasn't going to stand again and he can't really stand again in the Constitution. When did you decide, I think I can carry on, not the mandate, but carry on, I guess, and be uh, president as well and put my name forward? Yeah, I mean, from, from being on the board from since 2017, I mean, with, because of my age at the time on the the age difference when you look around the board room, you know, it, it was, there was clearly the idea of that someday this could actually be a reality, mm. right? And I've always, uh, I've been the president of St. Vincent Grenadines Cricket Association and then Winwood's president. So naturally you think that, you know, you know, if you stick around long enough at some point, I, I was approached, I remember in 2018 it was when I was forced approach to consider being the vice president. Mm. And at that point, I thought, well, you know, this is probably a bit earlier than I anticipated. And, but once I was sort of given that confidence to be the vice president, then there was absolutely no doubt that I received similar vote of confidence from the majority of the board mm. to become the president. Um, it happened quite organically in that, you know, Ricky decided that he was not going to go back. He, he, he had indicated that to me very early. Mm. And so it was just for me to position myself that when that time comes for me to be ready. And it's more about preparing for the role, preparing and showing my relationship with the different directors or uh, song, you know, so that I won't get sort of any unnecessary um, pushback or challenges or unnecessary hurdles that I have to pass across in terms of relationship building. Mm. Because that's, that's what is most important, how you, you know, interact and engage people. And once I, I was at a point where I realized that I would get the support, then you know, I had no doubt at all that you know, the transition is going to be a seamless one. And as Ambassador is the uh, VP, how did that uh, relationship manifest in terms of, and actually in general in, within Cricket West Indies, so you would have been approached by Ricky, do you want to be VP? Do you similarly what you approach as him, or how, does, how did that how did that manifest? Well, Azim and I, we have, we have always enjoyed a very good relationship on the board from ever since I was a director. And it, it happens back then, you know, I mean, from the time Azim realized Ricky was moving on, we would have had a conversation that, you know, what are your ambitions, you mm -hmm. know? And I knew of his and he knew of mine. And we decided that, you know, once the opportunity um, present itself for a leadership, then we're going to work together and, and support each other. And so far, I mean, Azim is a very experienced um, cricket administrator. Mm -hmm. um, and with that, you know, I've seen like tremendous cricket. I mean, you guys follow cricket. There's nowhere else in the Caribbean that, that plays more cricket than Trinidad mm -hmm. and, and Tobago. And so it's really a privilege to work with him. He understands the cricket administration really good. Um, and I have his full support, he has mine. And I think together, you know, we could really move West Indies cricket in the right direction. And looking at moving cricket in the West Indies cricket in the right direction, some programmes started under Ricky and yourself. So if we turn our attention to the domestic game, things like the West Indies Academy, the coaching programme, um, West Indies A, which obviously they've just come back from a successful tour of Bangladesh, uh, against Bangladesh in that unofficial test series. What is your honest, raw view on where the domestic game is at, where you want to take the domestic game to. And I say that in the context of, we all know around this table that all it takes is one defeat for the West Indies cricket team, for everything to be doom and gloom, standards are awful and so on and so forth. Having been on the board since 2017 as a director to now, and almost seen like a six year, I guess, transition, what do you see as the state of play now and where would you ideally like it to go domestically? Yeah, the system domestically, I mean, there's, there are so many deficiencies, right? Um, deficiencies in, in structure, mm. in terms of the system, deficiencies in, in terms of infrastructure. It happened quite organically in that, you know, Ricky decided that he was not going to go back. He, he, he had indicated that to me very early. Mm. Programs, you know, they're needed. If, if we don't get all those things right, not necessarily overnight, but you know, 
over period. I, I don't see any reason why we can't accomplish most of those things within the next two years, mm -hmm. as in having some a, a more robust system, meaning part with management of players, meaning a player could, you know, narrow in the gap at the international level mm -hmm. and the and the domestic level. Also, getting more, you know, coaches upskilled. There. Right, that has started off here, obviously. Um, you, you would have seen under that's one of the accomplishments under Jimmy Adams, mm -hmm. where we have sort of you know had an you know, a, 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 well, well, I can't remember the figure, but you know, hundreds of persons of skill. Mm -hmm. Um, th there's more practical work needed, so they are certified, but not necessarily you know, they don't have the practical yet, so that is that is necessary. But, but Marshall, it is really a case of, you know, <laughs> getting people to accept that our domestic cricket, you know, needs work, mm -hmm. right? And, and that is where most improvements start, by accepting that, you know, there's a, there's a struggle now and you're not good enough at that level. So whether it is the, 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 the youth programs or the franchise system or the women's program, which is, you know, domestically, we have just seen the, the female tournament. I mean, there's a lot of work to be done. Mm. So I am just trying to get everyone to accept that improvement is absolutely necessary now, mm. right? And the sooner we get that done, we get across that hurdle of getting everyone to accept across the board. And this is all stakeholders. This is the cricket administrator. This is the government, right, across the country. They have to invest in infrastructure. Right, and the players themselves have to realize that you need to train harder, you need to commit. So, if a, if a coach or administrator said that we're going to extend from four hours of training per day in the franchise system to six, seven hours per day, you know, no, this is not, not um, punishment, this is just a professional system we are establishing. And, and these are the kind of things that we need to establish in the coming months. You're going to see some drastic changes in the franchise system pretty soon. Um, by the resumption or uh, the commencement of the new tenure, the new contractual period. And I think that would bear uh, much, much fruit um, in terms of, you know, advancing our domestic cricket. Yeah, I want to talk about uh, domestic cricket, the West Indies Academy. So me and Mash have often talked about, often you'll hear players in the past who have played at under-19 level, they sort of disappear into a void. And then you've got a cohort of players age 25, 26 who have played a handful of first class games, not much experience. Yeah. The Academy has obviously bridged that gap. Yes. Um, we saw in the Headley Weeks Tri Series, the Academy, surprisingly to a lot of fans, won the Tri Series. We saw some outstanding performances. Young Kirk McKenzie hitting a double century against the most experienced, some of the most experienced domestic bowlers in the region. Just being in Cricket West Indies, talking to coaches and the director of cricket, in terms of targets and like KPIs, did the academy, was this expected the academy to sort of perform this well so quickly or did they exceed even expectations of those within Cricket West Indies? I don't know if you could really say, there, there were a few standout performers, mm. right? Um, same Cork, you mentioned Cork yeah. McKenzie, um, Kev, Kevlan, I think he scored 100 as well, and young um, Wickham, right? Score and then Lane did well with the ball and a couple others, you know clearly grab the opportunity but as a team you still want more like you won't take and, and be, be real be, you have to be quite practical who are these guys being compared to Shabban Gill <laughs> age group right who has dominated international cricket already who just dominated the IPL so it's still nowhere close right what I would say is that they played against a subpar um, or two subpar teams Right, and it's, it's quite disappointed in a sense, but I, I enjoy, not enjoy, but I accept that reality check for everyone that here are your professional players, right, who, who should be dominating these youngsters who have only been in the system for about three months. Remember, none of these emerging players are, well, probably accepting probably three or four of them are in a, the franchise system, but they come in and dominating it. Right? It should not be. So when I said enjoy, meaning that, as I mentioned earlier, we have to accept where we are now in order to improve. So I, I, I was kind of pleased that these young emerging players were able to, you know, sort of establish to them that, listen, yes, the franchise system is there, but you could see what a three months program in a high performance setting could do. And the high performance setting is exactly what the franchise should be. Right? 
And then if we could have that sort of you know, consistency across in terms of standards across the region, from the high performance system in Antigua to the franchise system or all the franchises across the region, then you would see far more competitive cricket at the, at the domestic level. And what that means is the gap between domestic and international going to be you know, much, much narrow. I mean, the learning curve won't be that steep. And that, and that is what we want, because when players enter the international arena, you want them to, you know, be a shopman girl. <laughs> In terms of just, just quickly on that academy, with, and I don't know if you'll be able to answer this yet, I'm expecting the like, new cohort to be officially announced at some point in time or the next year of the academy. Is it that some players will be allowed to stay on in the academy if they're deemed young enough, talented enough, etc.? So take, take someone like a Kevlon Anderson, for example. He's been in it this year. In terms of pathway, there is no, and this is possibly one of the flaws of our domestic scene, there's no guarantee that all of these academy players who just dominated Headley Weeks necessarily get a franchise contract next year either. Um, Harp, um, uh, Harpy Eagles may not pick up a Kevlon Anderson, for example. Kirk will probably play for Jamaica Scorpions. Johan Lane may not get a pick. So is it a case that we look at it holistically and say, this player, this player, this player is unlikely to get a franchise contract in the draft, come back into the academy system for next year, or do you bring through a new cohort? Do you get where I'm coming from? I, 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 I mean, obviously there's going to be a decision, and one of the first decisions of the new director of cricket, you know, so I'm not going to make that decision for them. And the obviously newly appointed cricket committee, cricket and um, development committee. But I, I see no reason why not. We, we have to ensure that these youngsters who have just played well on the regional scene um, get that exposure. I know there's also the, the idea of getting them to play in the next first class season. So, you know, you definitely want to keep this group of players in a system. Most of these guys, I think, are bordering probably still around 2021, 20, so they're under 23. And what we want to do is establish an under 23 program at least within the next six months or so, certainly before the end of the year, have at least a structure for them to be, you know, included in that. And so, where, where they will miss out at the franchise level, right? They shouldn't be lost in the system because we have seen, we have lost so many players in that 19 to 23 bracket, you know, that age group there that we can't afford it anymore because our talent pool is already small. When you, you know, obviously, relative to all our, you know, even New Zealand, they probably have, a, you know, more players than us. So we can't afford to lose anyone. If you have played for West Indies on the 19 team, then it means that you, you have a certain level of talent that we expect you could perform at the senior level at some point. So we can't afford to lose any of these players. And um, we obviously put, when we announced you were coming, you were doing an interview, we obviously put questions to a lot of fans on social media. And a big one that came out in terms of commercial and marketing. So for instance, at the moment, West Indies are playing against the UAE. There's no sponsor in their shirt. Fans will naturally message us on social media and be like, where's the sponsor? What's going on with West Indies? You've talked about the brand of West Indies, how strong it is, but success on the field essentially attracts commercial marketing deals, sponsorship. Sort of how have you got around that? Because it's essentially, it's almost like a catch-22 situation. You need that sponsorship and deals to invest back in West Indies cricket and that will eventually produce results. So how have you got around that in terms of selling the brand of West Indies cricket so far? Yeah, the, 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 the marketing and commercial component is, is arguably the most important component of the cricket because, you know, without money you can't do anything. You can't develop players, you can't invest in in system, you can't fly players to Antigua for them to be part of the high performance program. So it's, it's important that we revamp the way we, we have gone about our commercial affairs. And uh, that is something that certainly has my focus. Um, I've put together a very experienced um, and professional team to be on the commercial and marketing committee. And they are prepared to, I think they're preparing to have them meet their first meeting any minute now, and probably over the next few days or so. And I expect from them a few suggestions in terms of how we go about that, doing exactly what you just said, ensure that we capitalize on our brand. Um, and it's just sometimes understanding the market a little better, right? We have gone through a diff diff difficult period after the pandemic, you know. It has certainly, we have enjoyed a few benefits from it, you know, 
podcast like yourself, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so we, uh, you know, I have capitalized. Um, but, you know, there are benefits as well. There are different ways we could reach people across the globe because people now have a greater appreciation for remote meetings. And so we don't have to fly to India, fly to Australia, fly, you know, to have these meetings. And so we, we, we could save some, some money while still reaching our market. And I just think that there's so, many, so, so much potential there in the market and, you know, sometimes it's just confidence. Winning helps. Yeah. Winning helps. I mean, most people prefer to be associated with winners. And that is it. And what we have, quite frankly, is we, we, I could see a momentum that is taking place here um, with some positive results have gone our way. Um, even started in South Africa. Yeah. Um, some may say, well, you can't count UAE, but had we lost, it would have been a totally different, you know, situation. So these little things, add, uh, you know, they, they, they add up, and it's about continuing that momentum, ensure that the players understand their responsibility as well. They need to engage with fans, you know, they need to engage fans. So we need to position the players in a way to engage fans. I'm sure you remember the days when, you know, these players used to be engaging, signing autographs and all these different things. You don't know, you could be signing an autograph for, for a child whose father, mother is a CEO of a major company and you know, you know that, that, that CEO decide, well, you know, you know, they made my child so happy. You know, how you, know, you, 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 how you, you know, sort of excite a taxi driver who is, who is driving around a, a, a senior executive and, and because of how you're talking about West Indies cricket, you know, and so much to them. You know, and they see, well, boy, these are our customers, hey, and, you know, we have to... So, so this is a holistic approach when it comes to commercial and marketing, and we have to get it right. It's interesting because Cricket Island, obviously, they played England in a recent test, and their board essentially said, whilst the Lord's test was nice to play, it's not the pinnacle for them, it's the ODI World Cup qualifiers, just because what it can do for Ireland in terms of yeah. awareness and building their own brand. West Indies are obviously in that World Cup qualifiers. I believe the team would have flown to Zimbabwe today and landed, so it's just about to start soon. Just from your perspective, just how important, from a financial and in terms of long-term view of West Indian cricket, just how important is it for the side to qualify for those 2023 ODI tournament? Well, I mean, regardless of what measurement you use, it's absolutely important. You know, we have to play the World Cup. You know, and I think the, the boys understand that fully well. They could see them, they're, they're on a mission. Um, one of the things that stood out in the interview for Darren Sami is understanding these assignments, understanding the need to win now, right? And by, by you know, that sort of desire and hunger to win and believe that we have the, 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 the team, we have the players who are capable of not only winning the qualifiers, but winning the World Cup and, and, and impressing and doing very well, you know, surprising everyone. And, and, and with that kind of mindset, you know, I have no reservation at all that we are going to do well and, you know, qualify, win, you know, and then move on to the, to the, to the World Cup later on in India. In terms of, I mean, Santoki spoke about like the first 176 days, etc. You've made quite a few decisions. I say you, the, the, the committees around you and so on and so forth have made quite a few decisions and actually it's... It's actually worth pointing out that sometimes I feel that fans don't understand the structures of Cricket West Indies. So Ricky would have had this, pre probably previous presidents before Ricky have had it, in that I think people think that everything is just the president and nobody else has any kind of input in things, so on and so forth. But some key decisions have been made in recent months. Uh, Jimmy Adams obviously has um, is, will no longer be director of cricket. You've made the made the majors, Cricket West Indies have made the major decision of Darren Sammy being the new white ball coach. Andre Coley, red ball coach. Um, prior to you becoming president, I should point out as well that Wynwood Islands had their own decisions as well with regards to a new coach, etc. So you're not averse to making big decisions. And it's quite a statement to make upon becoming uh, present to have these major decisions and <laughs> you're already therefore akin to the cuss outs that come once a major decision um, has come in West Indies cricket and likely when we have a new director of cricket you're going to probably face some scrutiny for that as well. Just talk us through some of the decision making that has gone on in the in the last few months and I, I, I say that because it was kind of interesting and Santoki and I spoke about this in episodes we recorded Ricky stepping down and you becoming president also coincided with interim coaches. There was always going to have to be very quick decisions made once you became president. 
and I mean they've been made what's your reflections on them now having had the the kind of media scrutiny that's come with it yeah well with these sort of positions you have, you have to be prepared as a leader to make what you know tough decisions really I mean if you're going to be an effective leader it means you know not, not just being able to you know go through the routine mm. um, it's about you know assessing things analyzing things being quite strategic key thing is consistency as well mm. right and you know I've always tried to be consistent um, I just have a measurable day and measurable when, you, when you're involved in sports every sport performance mm. right mm -hmm. ultimately you're judging performance on the field right so I could tell you that if Cricket West Indies you know, has a billion dollars in the account and, and, and we are losing on the field. So people are going to criticize the board and mm -hmm. criticize West Indies cricket because you ultimately today, you know, to win matches and that is what fans want. And so if you have personnel, you have, you know, contractors, employees or whatever staff, you have to judge them on performance, right? And so if you use that um, as a KPI, then the decisions are, are fairly easy. Again, it's just to be consistent. And so far, you know, in the case of Winwards, it was it was it was it was a relatively straightforward decision. You know, um, in the case of West Indies, then you, you have to understand that it's a little bit difficult, more difficult, um, a bit more bureaucracy necessary. And so, and, and I totally understand fans, right? Because even as a vice president going into presidency and you know certain things but you you you, you kind of you're reminded of you know processes and and patience because in in your mind you know that there are decisions that need to be made but there's a process that's going to take time and so there are persons who are always saying that you know oh, you have been there and you say that my tenure started two years ago, you know. But the reality is, is that even though you're going with a manifesto and you know that there are things that are necessary, you know, you still have to give some things time before you make critical decisions. Mm -hmm. And I think it's just a matter of processes, respecting and understanding the processes and being consistent. And you, you would see that throughout my, my, my tenure that, you know, persons are only going to be kept in place if they are delivering. Let's, we must talk on it and I'm sure Santoka will follow up after this. I'm not going to talk on Sammy, Shiv, etc. But I am going to ask you this question. What was it about Darren Sammy that impressed? Because I, 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 don't, I don't care about the minutiae of who had this, who had that. I just want to know what stood out about Sammy. We had some very good candidates, right? Um, we, we had about 20 two there about 22 24 the most applicants overall across red ball and white ball some applied solely for red ball some applied solely for white ball and a few applied across and we shortlisted like six um, two across both formats two specifically for white ball only and two for red ball so in a sense four across right and they were all strong candidates right um, for obvious reasons, there are persons who are employed, who still are employed elsewhere, that you can't reveal their identity because their employers don't know that they necessarily apply, and mm -hmm. you would ap appreciate that. But in terms of Darren Sami and Andre Coley, because I don't want to divorce them, yeah, you know, and I think, yeah. <laughs> I mean, a lot of times people forget that we hired two coaches. <laughs> Conveniently. But do, but do you know why? <laughs> Actually, I'm going to tell you, do you know why? It's because I think. Any reasonable cricket person yeah. should have expected that Andre would at least have got one of them, I think. But some, maybe some people didn't. Yeah. I, I think we expected him yeah. to, to get one of yeah. them if he interviewed well. Well, the thing is, is that you don't know the other candidates were. True. Good right? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. you know, seeing the process roll out, it wasn't a straightforward Andre Coley case. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it was that he delivered well in the, in the interview. Um, yes, the experience that he had in Zimbabwe and South Africa would have helped him as well. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it was a, a, a comprehensive process. Whereas, had he gone into an interview complacent, right, yeah. he would have missed out. Mm -hmm. You know, and this, but Darren Sami is the same thing. Darren Sami has a mindset of a 
champion, hence to walk up, you know, Tiger as, as a captain, mm. right? <laughs> you, you, you don't win two World Cups much as, as a captain without that sort of mindset and knowing international cricket. Mm. And the delivery in the boardroom, sorry, on, to the panel was like a Darren Sammy leadership on the field, mm. right? Someone who clearly understands winning. Uh, when he was tested on the current game, the players, you know, not only at the international level, which was mm. quite impressive, but the pathway, right, the domestic cricket, the, what is required at the domestic cricket um, to sort of deliver, you know, players at the international level who are ready to go. These were things that he was prepared, you know, to, to, to deliver on from the, hit, from the time he gets a job at the point if he gets a job, right? And so we were, the panel were quite impressed, right? The, 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 the members, they were quite impressed with his readiness for the job, his, his what, how he, he had analyzed the entire landscape of our cricket. And he, he based on those different factors, you know, he, he, he won over the panel and, you know, he is now about to go to, well, I, 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 let me not discredit him. He, he has won his four series <laughs> as the white ball coach and now about to take us to the important qualifiers in Zimbabwe. Um, we focused a lot on senior men's cricket and in the academy a bit. In terms of women's cricket, from the get-go, you came in and you announced an improved travel policy. So women's players will fight business class, stay in single rooms. Um, was that something that had been building up before your presidency or was it something you, after speaking to maybe women's cricket or panels, you, you decided to do when, once you became president? You know what, quite frankly, all right, I only realised that the woman was still sharing rooms just a few weeks before the elections in March, right? And I, I had an idea about the international travel policy because I had to, you know, we dealt with this as a board for the men's not too long ago, right? Mainly for staff and so on. So I, I was aware of that. But it, it kind of shocked me when I learned at the time when I learned that they were still sharing rooms. And I thought that this is one thing that had to be changed immediately, right? And so that is when I made the decision that, you know, I'm going to ensure take this to the board for the board approval. And I mean, it was a no brainer, right? That, you know, we just, I mean, it, it took far too long and it's just something that, so, so yes, we made the decision immediately as well. In our first board meeting, we made a decision, but it's something that I, I had, you know, leading up to the election, I had strongly considered and I realized that it's just a matter of time before we change it. You said it, you said it took far too long. Would you say it was an oversight because it was women's cricket or were there financial implications? What took it to get to that point, essentially? Well, surely it must have been financial implications and just, you know, when there are different focus, if nobody, apparently um, when, I, when I spoke to um, Weeper's president and, um, and CEO, Ravel Hines, he, he, he confirmed to me that it, it, it was discussed multiple times before at an executive level. Um, but it, 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 I can't recall it coming to the board for discussion, right? So I won't be surprised if, you know, you know there are some things that if you don't necessarily discuss them at the board level, then you, you take it for granted that, well, it's happening anyway. No one complaining, so they must be comfortable. And I think that's what happened. So an oversight somewhat, um, but it was just never brought to the board's attention for discussion because, you know, but it, it's a, it, it's a finance, like the board policies, you know, they, they, they are going to cost us at a minimum of 500,000 US dollars annually. Yeah, so there's financial implication. And obviously with the women's teams, there's a vacancy with Courtney Walsh no longer as the head coach. In terms of the coach for... The women's side, is it similar to a Darren Sammy thing, someone who understands the assignment, motivation, or are you looking for something a bit more because of the challenges with the game um, in terms of women at the moment in the region? We're looking for the best candidate. <laughs> you know, there's still it's a very similar, pretty much identical process. Yeah. Um, I could say to you that the, 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 there are two courses already identified because the, the, the interviews I wish I could make the announcement here. Yeah, 
know. <laughs> but um, pretty soon it has to go um, the recommendation of one. So what, what normally happens is that the, the panel would recommend two persons, number one and number two. Mm. And, and yeah, that has to go to the board, I suspect, in the coming days. And once that is done, then we'll communicate it to the public. But it's pretty much 98% um, done in terms of the process. Um, so somebody has been identified from about six candidates were interviewed over the last, last week. Um, and yes, you know, we, 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 we're confident that we have someone who comes with some experience. Um, yeah. Would it have been the same panel that interviewed for the men's roles as yeah, well? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a tough process. Like, I've, I've, I've done interviews in the past, you know, for myself, like years ago. And it's, it's, it's just, I mean, drilling because you're talking about, like, each candidate, you know, is interviewed for about an hour and a half, right? Of at least five persons, you know, drilling you with questions. And they are, you know, difficult questions, you know, where, they, you know, you're testing your character, testing your knowledge, testing your experience and so on. And it's a very similar um, approach that was used, obviously, for the men's. Similar was used in the previous years. Um, from ever since I've been on the, on the board, really, um, you know, it has been quite a similar process. Just a few changes to ensure that you always bring out the best in the, in, to get to identify the best candidate. And so, yeah, these, these persons were interviewed for each about an hour and a half again. And hopefully, you know, we, we come up with the, the, the recommendation um, as number one that goes to the board, you know, gets the, the, the um, approval and we could announce that person soon and he could get, as a, as a him, gets the job going soonest. Listen, Kishore, as, as we said before we press record and started this, we, we said we wouldn't try and keep you too long. We know you've got other engagements, but it's important that, as Santoki alluded to at the beginning of the interview, that we, we kind of put this out to the fan base as well and said, listen, engage with anybody who wants to throw some questions. So I'm just going to throw a few at you, and Santoki as well may have some as well. The first one I'm going to just throw at you is re-PR. Now, this one's quite critical, Kishore. I sometimes feel that and I'm going, to, I'm going to say Cricket West Indies, but take that to be whatever you take that to be. Sometimes score some own goals, re-PR, right? And, and I, what I mean by that is there may well be really good intentions behind whatever the particular announcement is, but how it's announced or the medium in which the announcement comes through leads to criticism rather than a focus on what the announcement actually was. Is that harsh or do you, t or do you take that on board? I don't think it's harsh at all. I think it could be spot on actually. I, I, I definitely, I have identified, you know, opportunities for improvement um, where PR is concerned. I, I just think we need a bit more strategic focus on, on thing, um, a better understanding of our fans, um, our stakeholders and just approach it in a, in a more improved way. Um, so you know, it's not harsh at all. Mm -hmm. um, there are times, <laughs> even when I was vice president, or uh, now president, I'm saying, well, you know, why, why not this way mm -hmm. instead of that way? And there are times I have to, you know, sort of pause the process and say, well, come on, we could do better. Mm -hmm. But again, this is something I expect to come out of the commercial and marketing committee mm -hmm. um, so they could generate some ideas in terms of how we could improve our PR because yeah we shoot our foot in the shoot ourselves in the foot sometimes. Mm. Fitness and that and I'm wary you may say this isn't your remit and again I think I say this because okay actually do you know what one this is my humble recommendation one of the things that Cricket West Indies could improve is ensuring the fan base understand or have a better understanding of the structures within Cricket West Indies because Often you'll go to a press conference and somebody will throw a question at whoever, but it's not actually their remit to answer. <laughs> and I think the fans might not necessarily understand that that's not that person's remit and they're not avoiding, they actually it's just not their remit. So an example of this is fitness, right? And, but my question around that is, um, there's been so much about fitness this, fitness that, so on and so forth. Is that what is the current policy around it and is it something you may look to or Cricket West Indies may look to, not scrap, but alter 
or maybe it was altered and people don't know, but how integral is that requirement going forward? Or, quite a lot impact in this question, or is it important to have those fundamental basics, almost alluding to what you said earlier on about structures at the domestic level, to have those fundamental basics and stick by them and say, no, you're a professional. This is, these are the expectations. I mean, similar to all different components of, of cricket, I mean, we have to evolve in, in the era. So fitness is one that you expect is going to evolve. Sometimes you need to be a bit more fluid with certain things. And, you know, but you, you have to enjoy this it's, it's professional sport. You know, I mean, there must be some measurement of fitness, uh, some expectation in terms of standards. And I, I expect that we're going to maintain a fitness policy. Um, whether we, you know, we, we be a little bit more flexible or fluid with it, then that's a different thing. But as for we have a, a committee for that as well. We have a, a medical, um, well, sports medicine science um, committee. That's not the exact word, um, name of the committee. But we have one geared towards advising the board in terms of how do we deal with it. And we expect that they would, you know, they are going to research the market, understand what our competitors are doing, see what best practice are and advise us accordingly. And we, as a board, you know, we probably have one, two, maybe the most medical experts. So the board is just going to take advice and, and implement them, you know. So that's where we are with the fitness policy. But it has, just for the record, the fitness policy has not changed from months ago. It's the same policy. And until we get suggestion from the, the same panel um, committee, then I don't, I don't anticipate a change in. And I think the one, one we got from quite a few people, obviously there are a lot of factors at play. In terms of Test Cricket and the Future Tours programme, how open would you be to arranging Test Cricket outside of that? For instance, the one that was mentioned was a one-off test against Ireland, for instance. Would that be something on your agenda? Sure, why not? If the schedule permits, um, that's one of the reasons as well, one of the advantages of having split coaches, mm -hmm. as in a red ball and a white mm -hmm. ball coach, that you, know, you have more opportunities where you know, teams could go separately. Um, so there's nothing wrong with a, a white ball series going on simultaneously with a red ball. And so if it's a one-off against um, Ireland, uh, you know, who knows who else, you know, then it's highly possible. And we have to explore these things because, you know, these are professionals who want to be engaged. And the, in, in all fairness, the test schedule itself is not very busy. Yeah. So if we could afford the players a bit more opportunity to play cricket, then why not? We've just seen, literally yesterday at the time of recording this, young Alec Athanay score the fastest 50 on ODI debut. And I bring up Alec Athanay's not because you're from the Wimbledon Islands, but, but I bring up Alec Athanay's because he currently is the talking kind of young star that people should be, if they not, aren't already doing so, should be talking about. And the reason I bring up Alec is he shows at this moment in time that there is still talent that can progress through to the international level and when they get to the international level, granted this is his debut, but he's so far made the necessary steps. So I mean, it's domestic level, hundreds, 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 18, carried it on, uh, head, um, UAE, carried it on, called up to the South Africa squad, etc. So the point, the point I'm trying to make is there are still players making it through, but how, or in your vision, how do we ensure that Alec Athanes isn't a one-off <laughs> as opposed, and so you talked about Shubman Gill, how do we ensure we get more Alec Athanes? And here's the catch, Kishore. Alec has managed to do it thus far, but why, why, is, why is that, why does that feel like it's a one-off and not a norm? To, and I mean big scores, by the way, because we're not talking about, a, so Kurt McKenzie scored a double century. And, with, and I say this with the greatest respect to Kurt McKenzie, and he's actually backed it up on the A-team tour, etc. But he may then go on to have a slump again, and I hope he doesn't. Alec Athanes has maintained it from last summer in 2022 all the way through now to summer 2020, 2023. Backing it up, backing it up, backing it up. Why do you think he has, and it's not the norm thus far for others? Alec, no doubt, is a special talent, right? Um, but I, I, I've said many times that talent is overrated in sports. Mm. Because if you don't have the discipline, the attitude, the right work ethic, ethic and so on, you're not going to perform. 
right? Regardless of how talented you are. And it's, it's almost the opposite, you know? I mean, the reverse, that there are persons who, I recall, you know, coming across as quite ordinary. And they have dominated international cricket, you know? So looking ordinary at uh, lower levels, junior level, and when you check the records by the end of their career uh, at the senior level, then, you know, they, they, they have a very good average, whether they're batting or bowling. And you talk about tough decisions, right? A turning point in Alex's career, and he, he admits this from time to time, is when he lost his contract as a franchise player mm. uh, a couple of years ago. And you were president at the time. I was, I was, okay. I was, I, I was president, <laughs> right? Yeah. And I just had, I think it was, it could have been 2019, right? So just became president taken over from a Dominican, Emmanuel Nanton. Oh, of course. Yeah. And you could imagine Dominican saying, well, you know, <laughs> you know, some, some insularity day, right? <laughs> because, you know, you're punishing Dominicans. <laughs> and it was said, and, you know, I was crucified by it, because as the president, you know it is. It's no different from when was done West Needs. The president mm -hmm. is crucified the most for decisions. Although, I mean, I would take responsibility there, because when it, when it comes to contracts, the board approves them. So it's not like normal selection of a team where the selectors mm -hmm. ultimately select the team. But the contract, the board has to approve, right? And I recall, you know, Alec is one of the recommendations to lose his contract. And the board would have been in a position to overturn the decision and say, hey, there's a youngster that, you know, for sure he's going to be an international player, mm -hmm. the senior level. But you're taking away his contract now. And what I recall us doing then, a few of us as the administrators, asking a few questions, as in, you know, why? And his performance clearly merited losing his contract. Mm -hmm. Because we, we, we knew of his talent, so we know that he's not doing himself justice. And we decided that, okay, fine, let him lose his contract so he would understand the value of his contract, but ensure that the support is there while he's out of a contract so that he doesn't, you know, get, get, you know, we don't want to lose him out of the system. Mm -hmm. So what we did, although he lost his contract, we ensured that he was able to still come to Grenada right. and where the franchise, you know, was based at the time, and he could still train with the guys. And that's what happened. And what Alex said is that that point, that reality check of losing his contract, something that he had taken for granted, was the wake-up call that he needed. And he made a promise to himself that he's not leaving this up to any selector ever again. That he's taking control of his game. And whenever he gets the opportunity, he's going to perform. And we have seen since then a, a new Alec Atenes capitalizing on his, on his talent. Mm. Right? So when you see these guys are training, you see Alec and Kevin Hodge doing the extra work after everyone is finished. All the other players are finished. They stay back and they're in the nets, batting extra balls and so on. People will criticize him for the reverse sweep, but that is something he practices day in, day out, you know? And, and so the, no, I have no sort of, I'm not surprised in any way that Alec is performing now so consistently because I understand his attitude. You know, I've spoken to him, a very intelligent young man, and, and he's quite ambitious. You know, he's not just aiming to make a team, but to dominate the cricket. And if we could get others to appreciate that his story, right, and grabbing those opportunities from Oli, improving the, 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 the attitude towards training, being more disciplined, and just having a sense of purpose and, you know, knowing exactly what you want from the game. I think we'll see more like Ali coming through the system. And um, before MASH wraps up, I think... There's a big elephant in the room we need to address, Mash, obviously. I think you might be neutral in this, but... Kishore, as, as president of Cricket West Indies, there's a certain distance that you have from the emotions of being a fan because of your professional capacity. However, in terms of football, I'm a lifelong Spurs fan. Yeah. I've heard through the grapevine, you're an Arsenal fan, Aguna. I just need to know, at any point in the season, did logic go out of the window and you, think, you thought, Arsenal, we can win the title, the title is ours. <laughs> I need to know. Because <laughs> if you had to win the title, I probably wouldn't be sitting here at this moment. <laughs> you know, um, one of my, 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 my best mate is, is an Arsenal fan as well, right? And, you know, whenever I'm not tuning, you know, I get updates from him. And 
Johnny is an Arsenal fan as well. Yes. Right. This is why I like Phil. <laughs> 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 you know, and, and you know, I was just last night we were having the conversation because you know he's he's living in England, so you know we we, we caught up last night in post, so, and he was saying, well, we ain't get to debrief the season yet, you know. <laughs> And I was saying, you know, the truth is, man, I, you know, I'm looking forward to Champions League, you know, <laughs> and I'll leave it at the start of the, it's, <laughs> it's at the start of the season, you know, you know, you say, well, I go next year, we go and play Champions League, so I'll take that. So I'm fine, you know, I think the guys, you know, but, but when you look at the forward, you know, just to go into football a bit, I mean, we have a, a forward line that is quite impressive. I mean, the most goal ever, I think, in the history for Arsenal, so, and they are quite a young group, so. Straighten up in the midfield and defence a little bit and who knows what could happen next season. <laughs> <laughs> well, what a perfect way to end the episode because I'm going to use that analogy for West Indies. Strengthen up in midfield and defence a little bit and you never know. Young Alec and we strengthened up around that and who knows what might happen with West Indies cricket. But listen, Kishore, obviously you've come on the show before. Last time it was remote. This time, we, once I knew you were coming to London, we had to make sure this happened in person. Um, it's been absolutely great to get you on the show and... Santoki and I always say the minute we announced that you were going to do this inundated with questions and that this is what I always say to people West Indies cricket and the kind of heritage and the support it's not dead the people are people are out there and people deeply care and when those kind of cuss outs come it's from a it's actually from a place of deep love and care about the product and um, that that kind of innate support will never die for West Indies cricket. You're the latest stakeholder <laughs> to, to try and kind of take us through the kind of waters now for the next however many years you're, you're in the role. And I guess it's only right, therefore, that we give you the kind of final words on the show, just in terms of 76 days in. Fast forward to, let's say, 2025 because there's a big year next year we've got 11 test matches tour of england which is a big one obviously etc etc world cup home world cup etc etc where in an ideal world i'm not saying this is what people should judge you by but in an ideal world where would you like people to kind of see cricket west indies by let's fast forward two years and if you want four years i'm committed to ensuring that the stakeholders whoever you know, at the table making decisions, players and everyone who are involved in, you know, impacting the game, that they, they have a, some sort of inclusion in that process of improving West Indies cricket. I think the more persons we have on board, you know, positively, you know, inputs being make, made from across the, the board, I think we're going to see an improved West Indies. I have absolutely no doubt talent is, but we have never been short of talent. Um, the systems that we plan to implement, um, so far I could see a few things shaping up positively. As you said, a, a big year ahead of us, a big year ahead of us. It's exciting times to be involved in West Indies cricket, to be honest. And, you know, let me just commend you guys as well, because I'll tell you what, right? And, 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 and I talk about stakeholders, and, and sometimes, and I've said this before, that it's important that we get stakeholders to understand their role in this process, right? Because this is not only about a president making decisions or the players playing and, and so on. This is about fans contributing in every way, or, you know, governments, or media, and so on. So I'll put you in the category of media for now. If you, I hope you take that, you know? But j just have balanced arguments, Right, balance arguments because because if you just have you know negative things being out there and push and so on, it, it doesn't help quite frankly, right? But when you have people being able to fact check stuff and just you know counter argue stuff, and I'm not saying that they are going to favor West Indies cricket, and I have absolutely no issue with criticism as well because I believe we all should be criticized and that's how we're going to improve. But just balance argument, and I, I think that. Without a doubt, I would say that you guys have the most balanced show, right? You heard it here first. Yeah, yeah. You know <laughs> right. In cricket. And so much commendations to, you know, Santoki and yourself, Marshall. And, you know, keep up the great work. But once I can get the stakeholders on board in the interest of West Indies cricket, I have absolutely no doubt that by the end of my tenure in, in 2025, we're going to see an improved West Indies cricket. 
I told you not to say anything that we're going to hold you, hold, <laughs> hold you to account over, but you said it now. By 2025, people, we're going to have an improved West Indies. But I caveat, that doesn't just have to mean on the pitch. I think it's, it's as much about off the pitch as it is about on the pitch as well. It can't happen on the pitch if it doesn't happen off the pitch. You know, mm. So things like structure that I mentioned earlier in the programme, um, improving our facilities, whether it's the pitches and all these different things, um, we have to make our facilities um, available for training. We have to have a bit more lights. We have to have indoor facilities, you know, and we have to have better coaches, right? If we could have all these things done, and obviously these are going to be made possible with generating more revenue, right? So our commercial, our PR, you know, those things have to improve. We have to get the human capital right because we have to have the right personnel on board. And so if we can get all these things in place and not to, and, and just mentioning all the pillars in my manifesto, if you realize, Governance, because people need yeah. to have confidence in Cricket West Indies, mm -hmm. right? Don't <laughs> crucify the president when you see certain appointments because you think, well, it is nepotism mm -hmm. or uh, insularity. With proper governance, then you would know, well, you know, I mean, this person might probably come from Winwards, but because of good governance practice, then you know the person is, is, is appointed on merit, mm -hmm. right? So all of these four pillars that I mentioned in the manifesto, they have to take shape in order for us to have that sort of, you know, favorable performance on the field. But I have no problem with you holding me to, 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 the, to, to an improved cricket. And I mean, if that is, you know, and there, there are key measurables that on your next interview, we can, we can, you know, dive into. But um, at this point, I am quite confident that, you know, we are moving in the right direction. And come, come 2025, Marshall, you know. We, we're going to make West Indians proud. Listen, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> that, that was Keith Rochello. I can't, I can't add anything further to that. He, he's, 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 he's come on the show. He's been open. He's been honest. I'm fairly certain that some of you will get us in the comments below, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, etc. By all means, do so. If you want us to get back to Kishore, if there's things you want us to ask him, please let us know. But thank you so much, Kishore, for coming on. Um, most appreciated that you gave up your time. Um, second time on the Caribbean Cricket Podcast we, we, we know there'll be a third time but in the meantime people continue to stay locked in on the Caribbean Cricket Podcast connect to all of our channels and actually do you know what Santok I'm going to throw the plug out there I'm going to throw out the plug because if we've got the present on why should we not throw it out now sponsor us <laughs> Sponsor the, sponsor the show people we're the Caribbean Cricket Podcast I've been Mashal St. Patrick Hewitt you've been Santoki and have a good evening, good night, good afternoon, good morning, wherever you're watching. Take care, guys. See you soon.